Hi, welcome. I'm going live today with CRGH Fertility Clinic in London. We are going to talk about egg freezing and people have in some brilliant questions around who egg freezes, why, when, whether there are any um, effects of egg freezing or complications, advice to patients, all sorts of things that you guys want to know. So thank you so much for sending those in in advance. Feel free to ask live or I can ask on your behalf. So just um, ask as we go. And we are being joined now by CRGH. Here they are in London. I'm just going to add them. <clears throat> Hi to those who are joining. Should connect any second. Hello, good afternoon, Dr. Sasha. Good evening. Say your name. Perfect. Good evening, Eloise. Uh, I do apologize for the one minute delay, but that's what happens when a technophobe joins Instagram. <laughs> You're here now, so it's all good. Um, and we're talking about egg freezing tonight we've had lots of questions come in and i know that it's a very popular topic and people want to learn a lot about it so um before we dive into that please explain a little bit about your role at the clinic Absolutely, Elias. Thank you uh, so much uh, for giving me this opportunity. Um, for uh, I'm sure quite a lot of the public is already familiar with my background, but just to summarize, uh, I'm a consultant gynecologist, uh, subspecialist in reproductive medicine and surgery. And after years and years of training, I finally got to do what I love doing, which is um, helping uh, individuals through their reproductive journey. Um, also a little bit background, my passion also, Louise, uh, is actually research and clinical development. And I do feel, and some of the questions that may our, um, uh, our uh, uh, public who've joined us today probably would be asking is some of the questions that form quite a lot of my research because without proper research, we cannot give us our patients or clients definitive answers about evolving science, if that makes sense. So I am the head of this uh, uh, research and development. And in addition, um, I am the lead for the NHS services at CRGH. Very, very proud because actually for a private clinic to actually enable getting CCG contracts on the NHS, we have amazing success rates, but more of that later. But that's a little bit of a background. And I've just recently joined the British Fertility Society mm -hmm. for training my younger members joining. So that's something I'm again passionate about is training doctors to be as empathic and caring as they can be. Absolutely. Well, you're a very busy um, lady. So thank you so much. <laughs> Pleasure, um, pleasure. Could you just start by explaining what egg freezing is? Um, can I also be a little bit controversial? It yes. just makes it a little bit interesting for everybody who's joined in. The term egg freezing, and I think we need to re-evaluate what that term is, because in 2012, the American guidance actually removed the experimental label of egg freezing. They said, that the terminology used for egg freezing is very derogatory and very, it trivializes and very insufficiently respectful of individuals opting for this process. So they have actually renamed the terminology as planned oocyte, oocyte is a technical name for eggs, cryopreservation. And what they have suggested is by adapting this newer terminology, Elise, the shift in all of us recognizing the terminology is actually is a step towards seeing potential egg freezing in brackets as a very smart, proactive mm -hmm. and a very preventative action that we individuals can take for the future. 
So going back, and we can use for this event egg freezing at the moment because it's more easier to pronounce than POC, which is planned oocyte cryopreservation. But for everybody who's listening, I think planned oocyte um, freezing is the way forward. Um, but a couple of things, what is that? And essentially, um, a lot of scientists, a lot of doctors, a lot of researchers have looked at egg freezing initially with a lot of skepticism. And that has changed over the last decade because I think they recognize the social injustice, if I may say that, by reducing, by giving this option for us individuals, by it reduces the obstacles that we women face actually as our reproductive window is narrower than men if that makes sense so what is egg freezing is essentially the option or the choice that a individual can make if they plan to possibly delay this process for the future if that makes sense anyways mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think it would be also really useful for people watching and people who had questions to understand who egg freezing um, or pre um, egg preservation is best suited to and at what stage? Because often I'm sure you find with patients that by the time people want to do such a thing, um, it, they may be in their later 30s or early 40s. And I know that the general advice is try and do it as young as you can but obviously a lot of people may not be in the right place in their life to be ready to make that decision absolutely so um who is it for i think it's for all individuals across the board however we need to be aware of a few things it could be uh, uh women who are putting their reproductive choices for the future mm -hmm. and we talk about um, you know, delayed motherhood, or we even talk about uh, patients having treatment for cancer, if that makes sense, because where their reproductive choice is inadvertently taken away, those uh, patients can opt for planned or site cryopreservation, or even recently the transgender community, this is a viable option for choosing a reproductive uh, option for the future, if that makes sense. But you're spot on, Eloise, about talking about age, because I know I said it, it's broadly for everybody. Yes, it is for everybody, as long as we understand the misgivings of age, because age dictates to us individuals what success rates are and you eloquently summarized that actually younger we women or individuals are for choosing a egg freezing or planned oocyte crowd preservation the better is the success rates in the future and i'll talk a little bit about the success rates in in a little bit but do you think that when people hear that it might scare them into thinking, I've left it too late and what's the point? So would you encourage people to come and consult and find out what their chances of success might be? Um, Absolutely, Eloise, and you're, you're spot on. We all need to remember, we all live in an era of modern medicine. And gone are the days where physicians or gynecologists make choices for us. And essentially, we need to understand that when an individual is given a choice and they can make an informed decision, of course, it involves your spot on, they are of a better understanding of what is the process, what are the risks associated with the process, and what are the success rates specifically timed, tuned into their age, they can make that informed decision to go ahead with the procedure or not, if that makes sense. Mm, exactly. You're giving yourself choices and you're turning over, st you know, you're not leaving stones unturned, are you, um, to allow yourself to then make a decision about it. And what about people who might be um, conscious, not just about success, that it's a very expensive thing to do? I presume there are sort of financial plans in place and things like that if people want to um, see whether it's affordable for them. 
I do believe, and I don't want to mislead uh, people who are listening and are tuned in, but I do believe, I keep far away from the accounts department as possible because I do believe that this is a choice that should be made actually available for all of us. In fact, very interestingly, you mentioned that uh, about cost because the Nuffield Council of Bioethics in this country, it's a beautiful council where they tell us what is the ethical value in a procedure of is not. They've suggested that employees have to, employers have to look at looking at egg freezing to potentially offer as a benefit package for their employees because let's face it that our jobs or our profession could dictate or yeah. could influence our reproductive choices. So about the cost, I think I am aware that there are many companies offering financial packages and I don't want to comment on that. But I would suggest as for any individual thinking about that is to just seek advice from their particular clinic mm -hmm. to find out if there is any financial packages or support packages. If not, some employers, and I know some big names like Google and Facebook, they're looking at in sort of introducing this as part of their employee benefits. I think that's becoming more commonplace in the States as well in terms of insurance. But um, when, if people were to come to you, for example, just to get more information, do you think that some people might think, oh, it's going to take so much time as well? And so another thing is time, whereas actually it's not, a full cycle of IVF is it? So please could you talk a little bit about the process of it? Sure. Uh, so the process actually is involves a consultation because each individual has different risks, you know, have different body mass index, different lifestyle issues that may need to be addressed before you start the process. The process itself is a very simple process. It's a magnifying um, of what happens in our normal cycle every month. So just a little recap. Uh, without boring everybody in the audience. Essentially, for us women, on a monthly basis, we recruit on an average of about 10 or 12 eggs. We release naturally, in a natural period, one egg, and we tend to destroy the remaining few. So any way we destroy a few eggs every month to a process called apoptosis, and essentially, egg freezing is just an exaggeration of that cycle. So what would happen is initially the um, individual would see their consultant, feel comfortable, assess the clinic statistics or success rates before they embark on the journey. The journey itself is very short. You're right, Eloise, because it is actually an exaggeration of the first part of our menstrual cycle, which involves just taking hormones for 12 days and an egg retrieval process happens on day 14, where the individual concerned is put to sleep, deep sedation, and an internal scan with a tiny little needle um, extracts the fluid that contains the potential eggs. So to briefly, it is a quick process, about 14 days, but the planning of the cycle is more pertinent. And when I talk about planning of cycle is, I like to talk a little bit about lifestyle, dietary changes, nutritional changes, so that we enhance the quality of the egg that is being preserved. Absolutely. So that was one of the questions that came in. It was, how can I prepare for this um, through diet and lifestyle? Um, I presume people can look at the right nutrients, see a nutritionist, exercise, but not excessively, um, perhaps look at supplementation. What would your advice be as an expert? You have touched based on the important points, but let me step back a bit because Quite often, some of the individuals who come to see me suggest that some of my colleagues don't agree with nutritional changes. They think it's, um, it's, uh, it's nonsensical. But just to reassure the audience who's listening in, there is a field of science called epigenetics. What is epigenetics? It studies the influence of our genes uh, or chromosome structure present in our eggs. And actually, it is responsible for expressing the DNA sequencing, again, influenced by the mother's age, the environment and health issues. So if we largely ignore nutrition, we're potentially not enabling the individual to enhance their success rates at a later age. So 
What is the nutritional advice we normally give is we glean the advice from the European advice as well as the American guidance. And they talk about encouraging things like a high protein diet without going into a ketotic diet or even um, you know, your five fresh fruit and vegetables, your spot on I Louise about not indulging in excessive stress, because for some reason, some scientific studies have shown us that we individuals that involve or indulge in excessive stress, it can deteriorate the quality of our eggs. So again, mild exercise, uh, avoiding too much of strenuous activity and stress and stress de-stressing is one of my favorite topics because whatever we all talk about the, in a public platform about de-stressing, Eloise, I'm confident that we all have this background level or noise of stress affecting us individually. And this is what I tell my patients is if reasonably we can learn how to deal with the stress, either through mindfulness or meditation or lengthy walks or brisk walking or even seeking counseling or even talking majority of my patients love to talk to me which i adore because you know then we've got each other we have a conversation that quite often causes a uh, management of stress if that makes sense mm -hmm. very key the fourth thing is about supplements now i'm quite keen that my patients do take supplements because i cannot combat However much I advise everybody to de-stress, we all are in the background worried about something. And now the recent moment, we're worried about the new strain affecting our daily lives. Possibly stress can also, as I said, affect the quality of our eggs. And here is where supplements come in. And the Americans and the Chinese scientists have suggested, you know, things like omega-3, uh, coenzyme Q10, ubiquinone. Some of the supplements that I use, of course, depends on the individuals as well. So that is to summarize the importance of environmental and health issues before we embark on such an important decision of our lives. Absolutely. And um, I know that you said it takes preparation to prepare for egg retrieval and to help with egg quality. And I know the optimum amount of time is three months. But what would you say to people who may not have that time frame? Um, then essentially is to do an ovarian reserve test and discuss with your consultant so that with the next period, they can start the process. Because what is more important in the consultation, Eloise, is not only summarizing, as I've suggested, the nutritional aspects, but to discuss with the individual their egg reserve. Mm -hmm. Because egg reserves are very varied for all of us individuals across ages, across our body mass index. So this is very, very important to factor in. Number three, is also what is an optimum number of eggs because if we don't have that discussion the individual doesn't know whether they are going to go into this process three months or four months down the line because not one cycle will may get us the optimum eggs we may have to go through and consider a second or a third cycle yeah what is the sort of average i know it's how long's a piece of string but for someone who's um i don't know perhaps in their mid-30s um what would be the sort of average amount of cycles that they might be looking at to produce enough eggs to freeze for a successful pregnancy in the future? Very good question, Elise. And to be honest, I cannot give you a definitive answer for that question because each of us women are different. We have different egg reserves. Number two, our ovaries respond differently to the hormonal drugs. Number four is essentially the quality of the eggs that we retrieve may not be good enough to freeze, which may even require multiple cycles, if that makes sense. But an optimum number, if we're aiming for that, I refer to my American colleagues in 2013, they did a beautiful predictive model. And this is why I say it's very difficult to uh, class everybody into that same category. But mid thirties, you're looking at an optimum number of 20 eggs. But again, that would would depend on their age roughly as well as their egg reserve mm -hmm. absolutely we've had a couple of questions come through i'm just going to stop you there if that's okay whilst we're talking about sort of success rates uh before we move on to some other bits just so that people watching live can have some questions answered sure um 
Okay, so someone has said, what do you advise focusing on more? Spending the 90 days on getting weight and diet and pre-existing conditions under control before egg freezing, and sorry to use that term, but that's, <laughs> that's um, what people know it as right now, uh, over the age of 39, or, or, or move ahead, I guess, straight away because she's 39. Very good question. I wouldn't suggest 90 days. Not at all. Please don't waste time. At this age of 39 years, young time is of essence. So I would suggest have a discussion with your consultant. Start the supplements. Six weeks is all you need for an optimum turnaround. Uh, scientific reports have suggested so you can immediately start the uh, egg freezing process. Mm -hmm. This is slightly off topic, but someone has asked, do you treat immune issues at CRGH? Um, off the line, because egg freezing immune issues does not really factor in for planned oocyte cryopreservation or egg freezing. But to, the answer to that question is yes, we do look at it. And I know when everybody says immune issues, everybody goes into a strong stoic silence because this is one of the debates of the reproductive medicine era. Everywhere you go, they only debate about immune issues. For me, I do feel all of us individuals, immunity is responsible for cardiovascular conditions, let's face it, or kidney conditions, or even early dementia. So why is it when it comes to reproduction, everybody gets nervous and shies away from talking about it? Absolutely. Uh, I think one of the members of audience who probably said that knows my passion for reproductive immunology. So thumbs up on that. Yes, we do deal with that. That's a good answer, thank you. Um, a question, can there be problems when uh, defrosting eggs? Very good question. So remember, if all of us, uh, the audience listening to it, our eggs are very fragile. And the survival rate is very important. What is survival rate? Is the ability of these eggs to survive the freezing and the thawing process. The general quoting of survival rate is actually thought to be better with the advent of vitrification. Vitrification is a Japanese method that all of us clinics have adapted, most of us. And survival rate post vitrification is brilliant. 60 to 70% quoted in the medical literature survive the thawing process. That is an approximate range, Eloise. Each clinic is different for their survival rates. So I will tell all individuals listening, please call your clinic and ask them, what is your survival rate in your lab? And that would help make the individual sort of decide if, if that clinic is right for them or not. Um, it's definitely got better, hasn't it, egg freezing uh, success rates in terms of um, thawing eggs. Because when I was having IVF, um, my husband has um, azuspermia and he had a micro tessie retrieval, which was sadly unsuccessful. Um, so we used donor sperm. He, um, we were umming and ahhing about whether to freeze my eggs and then wait and then fertilize them with sperm at a later date. But at the time, uh, it was better to freeze as embryos. So how has that changed? Very good question. And first of all, Lelise, thank you so much for sharing your story. Quite often, as individuals, we are reluctant in sharing our stories on a public platform. A lot of courage. So thank you for doing oh. that. But you're spot on in terms of the difference in survival rates. About a decade ago, slow egg freezing was, uh, uh, the slow method of egg freezing was used where the survival rate was only 40 to 60%, so much lower. So with vitrification, the survival rates are amazing. But if we were to compare it to embryos, embryos are created after the um, eggs have fertilized with sperm either through IVF or ICSI. ICSI is just a method of injecting one sperm per egg to create embryos, but embryos are more robust. And survival rate post thawing embryos are better, 95 to 98% survival rate post embryo thaw. So I agree with you, we've come a long way, Louise, but I'm confident in my scientific peers that maybe there will be the breakthrough. I think the future Nobel Prize winner would be to detect two things, and you will agree with me. One is a method for us to tell us women or individuals that yes, this egg that we're freezing would result in a live birth. Isn't it wonderful if we have a test that suggests that? And number two, 
a freezing method where the survival rate is equal to embryo survival rate. Mm -hmm. And I think those are the future scientific breakthroughs. That would be incredible. Um, just as I'm looking through the messages, someone has said, we love CRGH. They had a successful IVF with you. We uh, love all our patients too. Please pass the message on. <laughs> okay. And what else? We had some more questions come in. Sorry, I'm just flicking through to find them. And whilst you're flicking through that, Elise, <laughs> I must say that at CRGH, it's not only me or a particular individual, Eloise. Remember, it's the team. Of course. So our nurses are an integral part of the team. I cannot be as successful as I am without the nurses, without my secretary. Uh, she's wonderful. Um, and yeah. um, my nurses, the nursing staff are very empathic because that's what we need when we're going to clinic. For, this is a tremendous emotional journey, Eloise. It is to make a decision, to make so many choices, to see if that is right for us. We need a team to enable that to happen. And that cannot happen without an empathic clinician, without communication to the consultant with the secretary and the nursing staff. Our nursing staff are amazing. If I were to have treatment again, personally as well, my journey did involve some amount of treatment. But if I were to go through treatment, I'll go through my CRGH nurses. They're very, very empathic. And our lab, because we are as good as the lab is and our lab is wonderful. Yeah. Sorry to sing their praises, but it's important. I remember when I was, you know, so thankful to my specialist, she kept saying to me, it's the whole team and the embryologists and everyone that has helped. Um, and because someone has just asked, actually, how do you pick the right clinic without them treating you like a statistic because of age? Excellent. And thank you for bringing I, I briefly saw that uh, comment, very valid comment. Please, we are all individuals, we're not statistics. Mm -hmm. And the only thing I will tell every single individual there, please, there is an element of intuitiveness for all of us human beings. And as you meet whichever clinic, I think every clinic has a relatively, an option of a free mini consultation where you get a vibe for that particular clinic, whether you do want to go through that. In that point, you need to assess whether this clinic is right for you for location, whether it's the right team for you. And the most important thing is success rates, which you can then liaise with a clinic to decide which clinic to opt for. Absolutely. Um, this is a more personalized question. So you may, you know, this person may want to book in for a mini consult um, with the team to have this answered. But what advice would you give to someone with low AMH and the eggs don't seem to fertilize on day three after egg collection? So that is a little bit veering from the topic that we're discussing. But just to let Everybody know, uh, essentially, I like the comment, yes, we are not a statistic. Absolutely, <laughs> cheers for that. A um, Couple of things is about the question about low AMH, Eloise. I don't like uh, the definition of low egg reserve, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Remember, for all of us women, we've got varying degrees of egg reserve. And low ovarian reserve is just a group that actually 40% of us women globally belong to. Let's face it. And as the environment is deteriorating, I suspect that that percentage of us individuals with a low egg reserve is going to increase. That's yeah. one. Number two, low ovarian reserve actually does not dictate fertility. Absolutely not. If all it does is it dictates actually association with poorer egg quality. And this is where nutritionists, and I've seen some nutritionists join on our live feed, very important, please speak to a nutritionist. They are valuable in seeing how they can assess to improve egg reserve. Acupuncture, one of the simple techniques that actually has medical science uh, association with improvement of egg numbers. You know, discuss with your consultant a uh, little bit of adjuncts like DHA, which is testosterone um, additions, could improve the numbers and the quality of the eggs. So with regards to fertilization and uh, specifically to your question, I would suggest book a mini consultation so that then you can get an option of what sort of options or choices we have for women who belong to this category.
Mm -hmm. Absolutely. My um, thoughts on it were, obviously, it's cost dependent, time dependent, there are so many factors. But if these things that are holistic aren't going to interfere with the treatment, and you're having the right advice around them, maybe it's worth trying. Um, but obviously, that's up to the individual in terms of what they believe and the resources they have. Spot, to on. Spot on, Eloise. And actually, you've summed it up very eloquently. I know some individuals go to different clinics and they get different opinions. They say, oh, acupuncture is a no, no nutrition. Oh, there's no evidence for that. What is evidence is actually based on studies, good quality studies. And the problem is, by the time we find good quality studies, we've lost that window of opportunity, if that makes sense. Before, about 10 years ago, and I think some of the nutritionists in the audience would agree, 10 years ago, nutrition wasn't even part of the fertility journey. But now it's become an integral part because there's evidence shows it works. So actually, there could be things like acupuncture may not, there may not be robust evidence. But in time, I think as time evolves, we may find good evidence coming through. Definitely. The way I looked at it was, I was saving money by not drinking alcohol whilst I was trying to conceive. So I wanted to channel that kind of saving into acupuncture because I thought even if it's not going to change anything in terms of the results, I know that from a mental standpoint, it will make me feel a bit more relaxed and slightly more in control. So that's why I did that. Um, but again, it's not for everyone. Um, so um, are there any risks involved in egg freezing? Very good question, Elise. So any medical procedure has its risks. Yes, they may be minimum. I've just said it is akin to our normal menstrual cycle. So an exaggeration of that side effects of the drugs. I know it's not a risk, but I like talking about all of us individuals actually um, essentially respond differently to hormones. So we may have headaches, migraines, mood swings, emotional lability can come up. And also what would happen is one of the other risks with stimulation could be venous thrombosis. What is venous thrombosis or thromboembolism is clots in the veins of the legs that can travel up to the lungs causing breathlessness. And Venous thromboembolism has getting a lot of attention in this country. Actually, I'm in the process of just completing a British fertility uh, guideline in this country, emphasizing the need for all of us individuals having any form of treatment to assess what our risk is. Because thromboembolism is particularly life-threatening. And if we don't know that, and it's like going on the pill. If there is a risk of thrombosis on the pill, there is a risk of thrombosis with fertility treatment. And that would be assessed by your consultant, if that makes sense, to mitigate those risks. The other main risk is ovarian hyperstimulation. A thing of the past at the moment, Eloise, because uh, ovarian hyperstimulation used to be as high as 2%. I know 2% doesn't sound high, but it's a condition where the ovaries over respond, produce lots of eggs. I know the individual and the consultant would be, hurrah, we've got lots of eggs. But then you begin to worry because the ovaries produce a sticky substance that make the blood vessels very sticky and pushes actually fluid into the lungs and abdomen causing breathlessness. So it is a very important risk to consider. But with the advent of IVF medicine over the last few years, there is a difference in the trigger medication that would minimize that risk further. Last but not the least is the egg retrieval process. Very straightforward, deep sedation, internal scan, and I said a tiny little needle goes into the follicles, but there are risks associated with the procedure like bleeding, very rarely infection, and also injury to the adjacent organs like the bladder or the bowel, say for example, right. to name a few. Thank you. Um, and um, to someone's comment about feeling like a statistic or a number, would you say that if someone didn't get the right feeling from someone they spoke to, a consultant, it might be worth um, perhaps speaking to someone else um, in the team, as in um, there may be other specialists that you feel more comfortable speaking to? Um, I must, uh, you're right, Eloise, and actually we must apologise to this individual concerned. It is 
must be quite upsetting for them to put that there, that they feel like a statistic. I apologize on behalf of all of my fraternity that who made you feel that way. But the most important thing, you shouldn't feel that way. And actually, spot on as Eloise said, seek another opinion. See if you get a different version of statistics or uh, the risk assessment so that then you won't feel like uh, you're a statistic or even an appendage, if that makes sense. But even within the same team, there are different people that you can speak to at the clinic, aren't there? So there are there's a specialist who you know, someone may feel more comfortable with a female specialist or more comfortable with a male specialist, and it can depend on the individual and the rapport. Absolutely. You're spot on, Eloise. So, and this is where the nursing team come in, because, you know, if they feel different, uh, some of the individuals, they tell our nurses and our nurses feed back to the consultants. Yeah. Uh, very important communication. Communication. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and is there anything else that you think that we haven't covered? Anyone else got any more questions around the topic? Um, thank you so much for your time and all of your... Sure. It's a pleasure to be speaking with you today and for everything that we've covered. So I hope it's been useful for people. Um, as we mentioned earlier, CRGH obviously offer consults, but they also offer free mini consults. So if you'd like to speak with the team, you can DM them directly or um, message me and I'm happy to put you in touch. Someone just asked, does it make a difference how long you leave the eggs frozen for? That's a very good question. Excellent, that's a topical question, isn't it? So yeah. um, uh, I know we are all familiar with the HFE recommendation. Normally it says 10 years we're allowed to freeze the eggs. Actually, I welcome and I applaud the government for making an effort to announce that they will be reconstructing, moving that limit to 55 years, which gives us the choice to make that decision should, when do we want to use our eggs, rather than saying, oh, we've got a 10 year limit, we have to use the eggs before that. So I think I applaud the government's decision. Of course, it has to still go through parliament and for the uh, leg legislation to change, but we applaud that. And does it essentially um, important how long the eggs are frozen for and that's the beauty of vitrification however long you freeze the eggs it doesn't matter in terms of survival rate of course the age that you freeze them for starts to affect success rates yeah absolutely but that's a big jump isn't it from 10 years to potentially 55 years why is there such a big because obviously if someone even froze their eggs at 20 they'd be 75 by the end of that what the government uh, probably said is not saying that, oh, yes, you have to delay motherhood till 75 years of age, but it's to give that choice, if that makes sense. We all are aware when we individuals embark on above 40, you know, there are other risks. There's risk of preeclampsia, diabetes and pregnancy, the risk of having a cesarean section. So, but we individuals don't need to feel forced yes. that we have to use that. So there is a time limit up to 50 years. Of course, depending on the independent health scenario, you would have to discuss with a consultant. But the, the broad thing is because sperm and embryos are froze to 55 years. And that's why the government said, OK, let's give these group of individuals as well the power to make that choice. I see. That makes sense. Thank you. It's been very, very informative. Thank you so much for your time. Um, yeah. See, I, um, well, you've written a always fantastic article for us all around this topic. Um, so you can find that on fertilityhelphub.com. And um, sorry, one last question. What's the absolute oldest woman's age for egg freezing in your experience? And I know that it will be patient dependent. Correct. So if you look at that, the HFA are very clear. Please look at the HFA report on egg freezing. It's a beautiful report. They looked at data, uh, which was 2016. So they published this report in 2018. They've suggested any woman above the age of 40 think very carefully because success rates start to, to go down. And if the individual actually accepts that egg freezing above the age of 40 is an insurance plan that may not work. The oldest or, or the youngest age that I've ever stretched to is 42. After that, I start to talk with the individual about the worth of doing 
social egg freezing, if that makes sense, because it may not be an optimum f um, choice for them. Um, another instance is I've done uh, somebody at 43 years young, but essentially they were absolutely clear with the statistics. And uh, 43, I would say, is the farthest age that I have opted for uh, egg freezing. Mm -hmm. I presume you may have treated patients who might have things like cancer treatment, so want to um, freeze their eggs at a younger age too. Absolutely. Cancer, medical, any medical condition that's preventing the individual from opting for reproduction, then yes, cancer. It also could be a benign condition uh, requiring treatment. So yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much for everyone to, for joining today. I hope it's been um, as insightful as I have found it. And it was such a pleasure speaking with you. Lovely to meet you, Eloise. And I, uh, I uh, just want one message that I would like to tell the audience listening in. Um, in very important to empower ourselves with the information to make the right choice so that that decision is opt apt for us as individuals. More importantly, please take care in this pandemic. Um, and some of the supplements could be also a little bit immune protective. So it does help encompass uh, what we're looking at in this event. Fantastic. That's really good to hear. Thank you so much. Thanks, Stephanie. Lovely to meet you all. Stay safe. Bye. Bye.